Hey, so hello everyone. Welcome to the Women's Wellness Podcast. My name is Amy Roper and I am the host of the Women's Wellness Podcast, where we empower women to make informed decisions about their health, life and family. Today, we are talking with Judith Yeasley, who is the director at The Confident Eater. Now, Judith works with over 100 families every year giving parents simple, practical strategies to support their children or child to try, add, and enjoy new foods. She works with individual families, runs workshops, and does professional developments with organizations who work with children and families as well. And in July, this is exciting, Judith published Creating Confidence Eaters, which is the guide for picky eaters which began kind of as a book aimed at parents of picky eaters who would like to know how to simply and gently add variety to a child's diet. But it's also perfect for those wanting help with the fussy toddler stage. And I can imagine a few teenagers and adults might find this helpful as <laughs> well. So welcome, Judith. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm really looking forward to this. Thanks, Amy. It's lovely to have, to, uh, to have me on and I, I, I'm looking forward to see it too. And interestingly enough, the theory of getting people to eat is very similar for adults as it is for toddlers. You know, obviously a few modifications, but it works pretty much the same. Yeah, yeah. Um, I will write down a question actually that I'll come up to later. <laughs> Okay. Uh, you'd be surprised how many dads start eating vegetables when their family goes through one of my programs. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So how did you get into this? I mean, if, if you were around 34 years ago, my mom would be banging your door down, waiting, trying to get you to help me as a picky eater. How did, was it an, a personal experience that triggered this or is it something you've always been interested in? Tell me a bit about your journey and how you came to writing a book as well. Well, uh, I started um, I, before I before I, I wanted to have children. Got all passionate about food for children because I thought, well, it makes sense. You know, whatever you put in, it's going to be better for the baby, and then whatever we feed the baby is going to be better for the baby. So I read every book and you know did it, everything that I felt was going to be the right thing. And then I realised that not everybody else was doing the same thing, and I thought, oh, that's interesting. And I found that a lot of parents had sort of gone off on a, on a track that they didn't want to be on and, and found it difficult to sort of get back where they would like to be. And especially these days, because, you know, everyone's always telling you, your child should eat this and they shouldn't eat that and they should be doing this, this, and, you know, and, and as a parent, it's a bit overwhelming. Mm. So I started working with parents and just giving them simple, you know, tips and tricks for how to just introduce the sort of foods that they wanted to that their child to eat and then every second parent was saying you know what i know what to feed them i just don't know how to get them to eat it and so i went oh well i can refer you to someone but actually there wasn't anyone to really refer them to and so what i found was when i started looking for that person they just weren't there so like your mum there, there just wasn't that help you know there's the old dietitian here and there who are doing things but really there's just a big gap you know babies to puree foods tons of information but once you get to sort of you know two that's it so i set out to become that person so i educated myself on on how to get children eating and um and then i spent I used my skills and I spent two years cooking with children who really struggled to eat and had associated is issues like ASD or uh, ADHD or um, sensory processing and, and teaching them, them to eat via cooking. Um, but that's not really where I wanted to be long term. What I wanted to do is work with, parent, with parents and empower parents and give them the tools so they could resolve issues in their own house because my my thought is always that a parent is in 99 percent of cases the best place to work with a child no one is more invested spends more time or knows a child better than a parent therefore giving parents the tools seemed like the sensible thing to do which is why i started running the workshops and why i created the book because you know obviously there's only so many people i can talk to personally and the book was my my way to reach into other people's houses 
give them what I believe is a great tool and say, look, you can resolve these issues. This is, this is, um, you know, this is a tool to get you to do. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Um, you mentioned children on the spectrum. Is it more of an issue with children with the sensory processing issues and when things are a bit more heightened senses or is it across the board? There are a lot of children who struggle to eat for whatever reason and there's, mm. there's so many reasons you can become a picky eater. There's, you know, everything from, you know, having undiagnosed allergies to trauma to, you know, um, enlarged tonsils, tongue ties, good, you know, there's a list right. as long as you are. But if you're on the spectrum, then um, they reckon about 80% of, of children on the spectrum also have eating challenges. So there's a massive correlation there. So if your child's on the spectrum, they're very, very likely to be, you know, to have eating issues. If your child has sensory issues, again, they're very likely to have issues eating at least, you know, certain categories or certain textures of, of food. Yeah. Mm. Right. And how, when you've got kids who are, because meal times can be very, very stressful. How do you start weaning children onto trying things without? Well, I should probably say, how do you help the parents relax and allow them to try things without getting so stressed out? Well, I'd firstly say that dinner's not the place to be experimenting. And, yeah. um, and, and that's often what we do. We go, okay, dinner, and this is where I've got my broccoli and my child needs to eat vegetables. So let's, you know, let's, let's get them eating the vegetables. But in actual fact, the end of the day, I mean, we're all tired, more frazzled and, you know, and we're all, we've had that sort of sensory overload for the day. Dinner's mm. usually not a great place to be experimenting. If I was getting a child to, to, to try new foods, I'd be doing it earlier in the day. And in general, I'd actually often be doing it away from the table because once we get to the table, suddenly the whole focus is on eating. And mm, it's the association. And, and, well, well, it's the association. Yeah, no, it is. You, you're absolutely right. But it's also, if we do something and when we're doing it, we know that the, the end result is that we have to put that in our mouth. Suddenly, it all becomes about the eating. And... And, and that can be really challenging. Whereas, for example, if we're cooking something and we're just cooking it, um, we are getting to know a food and that's the best way to get someone to try a food by getting them comfortable with a food. We don't willingly eat something that we don't have a basic comfort level with. You know, relate it to you as an adult. You go somewhere like Mongolia and they give you a dodgy looking soup <laughs> and you yeah. go... Ooh. Ooh. but if you're in mongolia for a year and every day you see that soup and they say to you, you know what amy here's a teeny tiny little bowl right here you just have that next to you you don't have to eat it but you know just get used to it being there that is going to be far more encouraging than here you go here's a giant bowl now you have to eat it and i think that's where we make the mistake we don't do that incremental stuff relate it back to reading we don't give our child um a dictionary and say right read this cover to cover we say okay here's the letter a <laughs> a for apple and we we do that and we talk about it and we show the pictures and we do all of that and we we sort of gradually move towards the end result which is i could read a book Mm, yes that mm. makes sense it does um i was looking at your website the other day and i saw that you had um 10 signs that my child is a picky eater or 10 signs my child's picky eating is a problem um is there any chance you can elaborate on what those signs are well there are a lot of different signs that that, right. that will that, that that set off alarm bells so you know if if uh you know and it's very normal for a child to go through a picky eating phase 
it, developmentally normal, somewhere between sort of 18 months and five, that they suddenly realise they're away from mum and the, 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 that sort of biological sort of um, hardwiring kicks in from when we were cave people and when you started to move away from mum, you might eat a poisonous plant and therefore children go, whoa, you, ooh, scary. And, and that's a biological response. So most children will go through that, that picky eating phase. How we handle that will determine what happens from there, but um, it is very normal to do that. Um, but when it gets a little bit more protracted, so if your child has, for example, a really extreme reaction to new foods where, you know, there's an absolute sort of panic or freezing or they get really, really worked up about the thought of just something on their plate, that's usually a red flag. Um, if the meal times are really, really difficult and really, really challenging, that's a red flag. If, if your child has, um, is, is really um, worried about going somewhere and it's all about the food, then that's a red flag. If your child is never adding foods, but starting to drop foods, that's a red flag. If your child eats less than 20 foods, that's a red flag. But I'm going to clarify that and say like a, a cheese pizza would be four foods because you've got the base, right. yeah. you've got the tomato, you've got the cheese, you, you know, you've got the, the, the oregano. So that would actually be four foods, not one food. But, right. you know, if you're eating less than 20 foods, so there's lots of, there's lots of those sort of um, um, signs that say, Maybe there's something more here. If it's been going on for a long time and you're just not seeing anything getting better, all of those are red flags. Right. Yeah. Because I, I can imagine, as you say, when the kids go through that phase, because if I think back to my, well, what I've been told from my childhood, I used to eat everything. I couldn't get enough of anything that was put in front of me. And then all of a sudden, it stopped and I lived yeah. off wheat bix. Yeah. And it's a stressful time to figure that out. And obviously, I mean, now I eat everything again, but how, how do parents navigate that blip so it doesn't turn into somebody who is 21 and only eats wheat bix? Very, very easily, actually. Yeah. Because the whole, and, and this is what the book's about. The whole theory of the book is if you can't accept change, you can't accept new. And if we do the same thing over and over again, our child will just continue to do the same thing over and over again. So like you with the wheat fix. So the wheat fix is, is a perfect example. If our child only wants to eat wheat fix and we only serve them wheat fix, then, <laughs> then it's logical what's going to happen. Yeah, so, yeah, and we just perpetuate it. And yeah. so... It, it, we need to change what we're doing to enable our child to do it. Now, obviously, if our child only eats wheat bix and we go, okay, well, you're having peanut butter on toast, the result's not going to be good because they're going to go, hang on, wheat bix, peanut butter on toast, not going to go the peanut butter on toast. So it's what can I do to encourage my child to do something a little bit different? So with that wheat bix, you know, if we always have cold milk, can we have warm milk? Um, but again, I wouldn't be saying, right, well, you have to have warm milk because no, that's yeah. not a positive thing. You would get them in the kitchen, we get them with the coffee machine and we, we put the milk in and the frother and get it frothy and we go, oh, whoa, look at this. We've got bubbly milk. Let's go and try that with the wheat. You know, so there's ways that we can approach this to so get a better result. Um, can we sprinkle some cocoa powder on our wheat picks and make chocolate wheat picks? Um, can we break the wheat bix up into little pieces? Um, can we serve some frozen blueberries next to the to the wheat bix and and and, mm. and bottle putting the the frozen wheat bix or you know put eyes on our wheat bix and show, you know there's lots of different ways that we can get our child and especially if it's a toddler phase because toddlers are great for you know and there's so many things we can do in that phase. So just gently give them a bit of a rock and gently get them moving. And I think that's what my book's all about. It's we, we so often go, but I'm so stuck and my child is so stubborn. 
every child I work with is stubborn. And, and of course they are, because they go, well, I want the Weet-Bix and I want the Weet-Bix like this. And I want it exactly like this. And the yeah. longer you do that, the more rigid a child go, gets. And they go, not only do I only want the Weet-Bix, but I only want the Weet-Bix on the blue plate. And I only want the Weet-Bix if mum serves it because dad doesn't do it properly. And it, suddenly you go backwards instead yeah. of going forwards. Makes sense? So it's, yeah, so it's all about making incremental changes and i suppose it's the same with with adults when you think oh i i want to diet i want to lose weight i'm all of a sudden going to cut everything out and change everything completely an adult can't manage that so why are we expecting a child to be able to suddenly change their whole way of eating and their the whole way of being when yes. even the adult can't do it themselves so yeah i understand that incremental change and getting the child involved i really like that so it's not such a drama. No, and it shouldn't be a drama, but also mm. it shouldn't be an ambush. So if yeah. I'm sitting there and I'm expecting wheat bix and you plonk down wheat bix with red things in it and it's all looking different, I'm going to freak out. Mm. If you have me in the kitchen and you say, we're going to surprise dad this morning and we're going to make some wheat bix and we're going to turn the milk blue so it's like having a ship in the sea you know that's <laughs> it's a totally different way to approach it and, and that's not to say you have to dance on tables and do whistles and bells and party girls at every single meal but if we want to make changes we need to market those changes and and and, and we need to you know work with our child rather than just expecting as you say okay we're going to go from crackers to eggplant here you go you've got yeah. to do this yeah so it's all about bringing in the play i suppose it's your children are children bringing yeah. in that as getting them involved and getting them learning and getting them experiencing life and well it'll help them in the long run as well but even as an adult mm. we're more likely like if, if if i'm hungry and you go okay well judith is an apple or a banana i'm gonna go now yeah an apple banana do you come up and you go gee oh, look at this i've got a fruit platter and it's got blueberries and it's got chopped strawberries and it's all beautifully presented i'm gonna go oh i might have some of that you know yeah so you know <laughs> there's, there's so many things that go into eating beyond just the okay it's dinner time here's your broccoli and chicken you've got to eat it yeah i've seen a lot of um, bento boxes yep is that a really good idea for putting little bits of everything and then the child can choose like when they go to daycare or school. Does that help with things like that? It, it can be really supportive. Um, I would say small is always better because it's less overwhelming. You know, it yeah. is far easier to eat a little cut up piece of apple than it is to eat a whole apple in general. Although there are kids who go, Oh, if it's not a whole apple. I can't eat it. So, you know, it's horses for courses. Um, and having, options is great grab and go is great so i'm busy at kindy i just want to grab this or i'm at you know my my now 11 year old at primary school always wanted small things because he wanted to put them in his pockets so that he could get out of the classroom and go play and then when he was hungry he'd pull something out of his pocket hopefully not <laughs> a, yo a yoga and and be able to eat it on the go um but there's always exceptions and having and i know that a lot of parents put so much love and there's so much time into this and then the the, the lunchbox comes back day after day and then that's really demoralizing mm -hmm. and also what they do is they go okay my child's not eating very well so they have 75 different options and of course the child opens the box and goes oh my god i can't eat all that you know and, and it's actually overwhelming so sometimes less is more yeah. um so rather than having 15 different choices actually only having three to five choices can actually be more positive yeah and eating something is better than sending it all home not eating absolutely and our goal is always when our child's away from us to get them to eat and that's the number one priority just get them to eat because if we get used to not eating that's a self-replicating thing and it, it's not a positive thing and also you know what hungry kids not great kids no no then they play up at school and misbehave and, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just, and they yeah. can't learn 
And then they get home and then they have a total meltdown and then actually getting food into them because they're so over hungry is, is even more challenging. Yeah. Yeah. And then their stress levels are up and your stress levels are up and everything's just. Yeah. Melts down. Yeah. 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 And then it's go to bed without any dinner and everyone's mum's on a bottle of wine and that's, that's a whole yeah, different yeah. <laughs> ball game. Yeah. Um, so when you say small things, so would it be better to say peel up a mandarin and stick a couple of slices of mandarin or just stick the whole mandarin in that's already broken up? And then maybe a couple of berries and a cheese stick, something like that. So you've got a uh, bit uh, of every food group, maybe? In, in general, yes. But again, there are certain children who go, um, if, it's, if, it, if the mandarin's broken up, it, it, it goes dry. The, the liquid gets on things. Um, I, mm -hmm. I don't want it because I don't know what it is. And you know, so there's, you know, again, you know your child best. So yeah. working with your child. If you're going to do something different, then I always recommend having a picnic with your child with their lunchbox, with the new thing in it, so that they are, you can gauge their reactions. And when they open it, you can talk them through it and you can support mm. them to learn to eat something that's a little bit different. Because like dinner's not the place to teach someone to eat new foods, the lunchbox is not the place to experiment. Yeah, I suppose you don't want to blindside the child when they open it at school with all these other people around them and they're going, oh, now what? So I like that idea of the picnic because yes. it does, it introduces new things and it's fun. It's not just a, right, we're going to eat this now. It's, oh, let's see what this is. Oh, do you want to try some of this or some of mine? Or And there's no reason why you could, if it's in the winter, you can't have a picnic on a rug in front of the fire. Oh, that sounds like a nice, <laughs> nice thing to do. Yeah. Yes. Picnics don't have to be for, just for summer. No, absolutely not. That's beautiful. Um, so we've covered a lot of the questions I had. Um, so how do you work with the families? Is it just in person that you see them or do you have online programs and courses or consulting like this? Yeah, I do a lot of my stuff like via Zoom. So okay. um, I, if I'm going to do one of my um, parent workshops, um, yeah. which is which are generally for families where they are ticking a lot of those 10 red flag issues, then I would do an interview first and we'd get to know what, what the issues are and then I'd run a personalised workshop. Mm -hmm. But I've also just introduced uh, new modules on my website so that you can go and book in for an hour's um workshop and you can choose so you can have an introduction to you know to picky eating you can have how to get your child to try foods how to have calm relaxed meals and go through a meal by meal plan on how to do that there's all sorts of, of options they all take an hour they're all 79 dollars so they're really super affordable and i will be personally presenting all of those live so you won't get yeah. recorded you'll get me talking to you and so the I'm parents sure. can ask questions as they go yeah and... yeah absolutely absolutely and that's the whole point that i'll be there and we'll talk through what's happening yeah and the workshops does it help to have both parents on board or ev ev all the caregivers on board do you have the children I... on there as well or do they no, I, I would say in general, without the children is, is almost always um, a good thing because mm -hmm. we're going to be talking about them. And yeah. I don't think that's a positive thing to have them listening in. Um, no. But I would say absolutely all, all caregivers with my with my parent workshops, um, all caregivers um, like grandparents. are invited. Yeah, everybody's invited and I encourage it absolutely all the principal caregivers should be there for my um 79 programs you're three people for the price of one so okay. hopefully mum partner and you know if 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 nana takes on three days a week then it's great to have nana there as well yeah or all nannies or you know babysitters or whoever else yeah. whoever it is that's in charge that's of good. their meal times at certain points yes would need Absolutely. that help yeah because you don't that's one thing that a lot of i've i guess a lot of mums would go right i want my child eating this and then they'll go to grandma's house and they'll go oh it's fine you just do this and it undoes a lot of work that mums yes. just try to do at home and then it's Ugh. yes but 
but grams can actually be really useful and really powerful because there's you know and especially if i'm crazy busy you know but but grandma's got time then maybe grandma does do some baking you know maybe grandma does put into into play some of the things that just take a little bit of extra effort that we just go oh the thought of doing that at the end of the day is not gonna yeah. but, but, but nana goes yeah i'll do that it's always more fun at grandma's house as well yeah 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 that's right <laughs> <laughs> they they're allowed to spoil absolutely yeah understanding the play and everything and getting everyone on board with different methods different kind yes. of I don't want to say attack, but attack from all sides. Yes, but it's also um, making sure that we're all on the same page, that we're all using the same language, that we've all got the yeah. same goals, that we've all got the same approach, because our approach, our, our, our language, and the dynamics within the house can make such a difference mm. to what happens to our child. Yeah, that that is the important thing, especially as well, I suppose, if you've got one parent doing uh, the primary caregiver and then you've got someone who's working more and comes home into yes. a stressful situation it's helpful to have both caregivers on board absolutely tackle that if they walk into something i guess but i also find that um, firstly um dads males in general approach things in a really different way mums say oh but but how's but how's, you know, how's Sam going to deal with this? And oh, what's he going to think when I do this? And how's he going to be if I try this? Whereas dad goes, yeah, that's logical. Yeah, that's logical. Yeah, that's logical. And, and the other yeah. thing is that even if dad's not home a lot and they're working away and mum's doing 95% of things on her own, just having somebody who's on the same page so she can say, you know, this happened today or that happened today or so that dad goes, okay, I get why you're doing this. Because yeah. some of the things that I teach parents are really counterintuitive. And, mm. you know, if you don't understand, you're going, whoa, hang on, why are you doing this? Because it, it doesn't seem very logical. Yeah, and it saves arguments outside of the situation as well. When yes. one parent's judging the other for not doing something or being too hard. Yeah, so it's yes. really, really, really useful. So they book... Um, via your website that was the confident is it yes it is absolutely yeah. and is that the best place for people to get in touch with you or is facebook or instagram good as well facebook i have a pretty active group and i give lots and lots of information on my facebook page so mm -hmm. come join us um it's a nice place to be there's lots of information on there and i answer every single comment so that if you do ask a question on a post then you'll get a, a personalized answer um if you want to get in, co in contact with me lots of parents do judith at the confident eater.com and you can do that via the website fabulous and your facebook group is that something that's just for the people on the courses or is that a free group that any no, that's parent can join free, free group for everybody what's that group called the confident eater that's a confident eater as well you managed to yes. get all the names right <laughs> you didn't have to add letters or numbers no 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 it's very simple perfect the confident eater free facebook group yes i'll pop yes. these in the show notes as well yeah that'd be great read my great. writing yeah but if you do have a child that struggles to eat please come join us because you know sometimes small tweaks can make a massive difference in yeah. what's happening yeah and i I could think of one person off the top of my head, um, one of my mums who I used to work with, so I'll be <laughs> sending your details her way. Um, your book, can they buy that from your website? Is it available in shops or is it just through your website? It, it's available through my website. If you're in Wellington, then it's in, in most of the independent bookstores in Wellington. Um, mm -hmm. I haven't quite made it to other um, areas of New Zealand as yet, but uh, that's on the cards. But yeah, through but the online, website. Everyone shops online. Yeah, and we can post it anywhere in New Zealand or anywhere in Australia. Perfect. Hmm. So I think that is all the questions I've got for you. Let me just have a look. We went through the wheat bix. We went through the um, the signs. Yeah. Is there anything that you would like to add? Anything that you think I should have asked but missed? 
I think, um, I guess my biggest takeaway is always, it doesn't matter how bad eating issues are, there's always a solution. And as the parent, you're almost always the best person to do it. So if you are struggling, look for help because yes, your child may grow out of it, but if that takes one, two, five years, how much stress, frustration and social difficulty do you have in the interim? You know, because everything gets difficult, you know, every everything, all social occasions revolve around food and then you've got holidays and you've got Christmas and you've got all this sort of stuff. So, you know, and, and there are a lot of parents where their child doesn't eat badly and they eat some fruit and some vegetables and everything, but they're limping. It's just not easy, you know, and every dinner time you're going, oh, I'm not sure if they're going to eat this or we have to stick to these five, you know. If you're in that situation, again, think and say, look, if I could make a change, would that make my life a lot easier? Would I feel less guilty, stressed, frustrated, whatever it might be? Would it be easier for my child? And if the answer is yes, then maybe just look for some gentle ways to to move forwards and everything i do is about returning the joy to food making food fun for everybody and everything we do is super gentle you know none of it's eat this or starve because frankly that doesn't work very well so it, it's the opposite how do we give our child a love of food and the more they love food the easier it is for them to move forwards Perfect. That's wonderful to finish with. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share a link to your website in my group because I imagine there are many parents who are struggling and I can imagine the women listening to this all breathing a collective sigh of relief at that last, at that last phrase. I know I was and I just, just from my own memories of my own picky eating. So thank yeah. you very much for joining me. I'm sure that they're going to take a lot from this. So thank you very much. No worries. Thank you, Amy. It was lovely to talk to you and I, I really appreciate you having me on. And uh, yeah, if anybody's got any questions or, or anything else, you know, feel free to get in touch. I will send them your way and I'll add them to the show notes.